is the day. You get out there, you do it. Um, this is and the so day. Figured, this is the day. Uh, there's reasons I'm wearing this shirt, but one of it, one of them is happy birthday, Dad. And then this is happy birthday. It's gonna Carpe us. diem. Seize the day. That's right. That's what you gotta do. You it's, got kind it. of, it's been really crazy this extended period of, uh, you know, kind of time out. You know, it's it's like it. You know, it's we've gone through all these waves of like, um, oh, this is so relaxing to cabin fever to like I gotta get outside. I just gotta get outside. I got fresh air to like where are we gonna get toilet paper to you know it's like all these like this new panic that we all have to like live in right now is just amazing to it's just it's like this it's totally like this it's just up and it comes in waves and it's getting down but we'll find a way through it we always do you know we always do and that's an just interesting life. article um the other day i'll see if i can find it and send the link but it it really says this thing that you're feeling now is actually grief right yeah. so we're going through a grieving process because yeah. we're grieving the things that we knew as our normal that aren't there anymore so it's like yeah. loss right we're all yeah. kind of thinking feeling this loss of community and and you're right in the beginning it's like oh cool a couple of days off this is different now it's <laughs> like i need you know, hugs. I need my people. I want I need... my life back. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> anyway, well, we've been. It's such. Been, it's been so beautiful here to just get outside, walk the dog. Max has got um, these Mars blades that he found that mimic kind of the hockey glide, and so we go up to the top because our our neighborhood's like this. So, but at the very top, it's flat. So he goes up with his stick and his skates, and he's out. He's skating keeping those muscles alive and um you know for any of you guys out there with rollerblades just ignite those muscles a little bit you know as we're, best we're doing can. some um we're going to do some inline uh classes starting next great week. yeah awesome I'm, I'm looking for mine i know they're in my garage buried but slowly that mountain is getting lower and lower so hopefully i'll find them and i'm going to get out there but i got my slide board and that's been really fun to get on but uh <laughs> Yeah. What if you don't have rollerblades or anything like that? I was going to well, say you... that, I'm sorry, yeah. Play It Again Sports in um, Brentwood is actually still open. So if you feel like you can go in safely or send a mom or a dad with a mask and go safely, I'm going to go ahead and just say that for skaters, that would be an essential errand. That's what I would say. Okay. Ah, okay. I literally just ordered a pair of inline skates because I wanted to go out and skate. Yeah. There you go. That's it. If I can't find mine today, I'm, I'm going to fall off my wallet and Amazon.com, yeah. scour the box down with wipes and all the other stuff and let it sit outside for a day and then hit it because yeah. I'm, I'm itching. I'm, I, you know, I don't, I don't crave skating, but now I do. I really do. You do. You just All right, don't gang. realize that you do. <laughs> so let's get started because we've got a special guest the second half hour. I don't think she's on yet, but um, I hope not. So I guess it's like we got a half an hour of going through a lot of really cool things. So Corey, you've been talking about history of figure skating a little bit. I'm sorry I haven't been on those. That's okay. Um, but I really want to, um, uh, you know, just talk about uh, just you know kind of from the olympic history just go through that chronologically have you discussed that with your with your students yet so we started all the way back with archaeological evidence and mm -hmm. then we talked about finland when it became more of a recreational thing and then we talked about the art being in, introduced and how it wasn't well received in america so we haven't gotten there we've just been looking at sort of a broad sense of oh sport. good good Shoot, because I've done a, little, a lot of research and I've gotten, a, you know, because a lot of this, okay, you guys, you have to understand that I am a fossil, which means that I am really old, but I've experienced a lot of really cool things and I'm going to share a little bit that some of it's philosophical, some of it's actual historical, some of it is Forrest Gump stuff where I just kind of cross paths with these people, but um it's it's insane just how rich the sport is to study and and just you know as, as just as just for the sake of if you know whenever you have time i want you to kind of get on 
um, on Wikipedia because it's not always great, but sometimes it's okay. But um, you know, you go on. There's two play, the, the, the figure skating at the Olympic Games is one site that you want to study on Wikipedia, and the other one is list of Olympic medalists because it kind of gives you a lot of really cool links where you can kind of get to know them all a little bit better. So um, some of this has come from there, but a lot of it has come from just my own experiences. So I, I will say this, um, figure skating hit uh, a financial crisis in the 2000s, right? They signed these ridiculous contracts, these $100 million contracts. And then when they expired, like they, no one wanted to renew them because the way that they were negotiated, anyway, it's a long story, but anyway, they started to hit this financial crisis in the 2000s where there was no more money coming in. And so the first thing they wanted to do was dump the museum. They wanted to like get rid of the museum. And I was like, no, <laughs> you can't do that. And they're like, why? And I go, because here's the deal. And this is something I want you to write down because it's really important. If you don't honor or remember your past, the present is meaningless, which makes the future non-existent because it, it becomes, everything becomes disposable. If everything in your life is like, doesn't matter. If, if you're willing to just like let things go, then you, you've really like with, when the, they said they want to spin off the museum, they made the sport disposable. And if, if that's the case, then why bother? I mean, the whole thing about getting up every day and trying to accomplish and trying to, and to, to really celebrate the, the, um, the history and the legacy of the sport to learn from and to see the ascension of ability and quality is really rich in our sports history. And so looking at that, um, you know, I'm really grateful that, you know, U.S. figure skating woke up to the fact that, okay, yeah, we really need to protect our past. We need to honor it. We need to celebrate it. We need to have a destination for it. So the museum is live and well. And if you haven't ever been to Colorado Springs, the museum, it's really good. They've done it in a way where it's, it's interactive. You can watch videos, you can look, and there's one wall with all the champ US champions ever in history, just their faces kind of plastered all over the place. But you can see medals, you can see costumes, you can see uh, sculpture, you can see, you can really experience um, the rich history of US figure C, and there's a lot of world stuff there as well. So if you go to Colorado Springs, that is your first stop. Just go to US figure skating headquarters, and the museum is there. So. According to this Wikipedia page I told you to go to, the all-time leader in Winter Olympic medals is the United States with 51 Olympic medals, okay? So here's what's the funny thing, <laughs> right? Second place was Russia with 26. Third place was the Soviet Union with 24, which is the same thing, right? And then you get to the unified team uh, the Olympic ath athletes from Russia, that was in 1994, and they had three. So you add those up, it's 54, but let's, let's break that down. Two of those medals in 94 were Oksana Bayul and Viktor Petrenko gold from the Ukraine. So that's a different country. So uh, honestly, we've tied um, Russia. So, so whenever like, you, you know, you see and you hear these names that are so rich and, and so, you know, it's like, you know, I go back to whenever I have the pleasure of meeting a, a new Olympic champion in men's figure skating, because, you know, it's like, welcome to the club, blah, blah, blah. If I ever have that opportunity to, to spend some time casually, I'll say, okay, so do you think you're a big part of history? They'll go, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm the coolest thing ever. And like, yeah, I mean, they're their medal is still around their chest and they feel like they're you know, bigger than life. And they're just like, I'm it, I'm the stuff, right? And it's like, okay, well, let's just, can we just have a, um, can I just ask you like a really weird question? And, and they go, absolutely. Cause you know, I'm it, right? I, <laughs> the top of the, okay. I, how far back can you go? Like how far back can you go? How many, how many Olympic champions in men's figure skating can you go back? And it's outrageous. The first person I ever asked that question was Brian Boitano. And it was, you know, we were just, you know, he, he just come out of, 
it was the year after the Olympics. He had, you know, they made this Bolero movie. They did all these. He, he was on by creating a tour. He was it. I mean, he was awesome. And and I love Brian. And I and I and I go, how how far back can you go? And uh, he goes, uh, and he started thinking back. And he went back really far. And I go, okay, can, let me ask you a question. Who won the Olympic gold medal in men's figure skating in 1964? Do you know, Corey? <laughs> See, that's it. And Brian didn't know either. I go, it's that guy right there who's judging you tonight in this professional competition. And if you, if you cannot remember the name Manfred Schnelldorfer, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like a memorable name, right? So, and then what's even more funny was in 1968, a guy named Wolfgang Schwartz won the Olympic gold medal in men's figure skating. These are awesome names. I mean, where else can you find names like that except in, in figure skating? So it's like, I always go back and I go, how far back can you go? And they, they like, they go, uh, uh, and they get stuck a little bit. I go, so let's all put this in perspective. It's really a great thing. Congratulations. You've climbed the mountain. You're at the top of the game. And we got to really know what's going on in our sport. So looking back, you know, you can look at, um, uh, you know, most can't go past, past five champions, and there have been 20. In, uh, well, 21, including Nikolai Panin's uh, 1908 gold for special figures. They would create these shapes on the ice and have the trace. It was really cool when you go all the way back to to that. So, you know, you, you look at all the men's champions throughout the years and, and you had uh, like Ulrich Salkow who, who invented the Salkow and, and even guys like Alois Lutz who created the Lutz. He's not, he never won an Olympic championship, but you've got all these guys and it was figures. And then, and then came this really studly guy named Dick Button and he changed the sport forever with, you know, just athleticism. Uh, doing triples for the first time in competition. He was unbeatable for five years, won two Olympic gold medals, five world championships, and he changed the sport forever. I still call him the greatest of all time because he invented things like, hmm, let me think, the flying camel was invented by Dick Button. And the crazy thing was his coach wasn't even a skater. He was a ski jumper. His name, <laughs> like Gustav Lucy was his coach. And he was a, he was a, he was like a ski jumper and like a Nordic combined skier. He just understood the physics of the human body and how to make things happen. And, and I had the pleasure of, of actually having a couple lessons from Gus Lucy and, and he was so insane and crazy and creative and just he broke down everything and he was able to teach things in a really unique way and when we get back on the ice um, with you guys I'll share some stuff that I learned from uh, Gus Lucy who is just it was just unbelievable but you know you look at the men from those years Dick Button won two in a row then Hayes Jenkins uh, won the next one and then David Jenkins won the next one after that and then there was a little bit of a break uh, where the Europeans were winning. It went Schnelldorfer, then it went uh, uh, Wolfgang Schwartz, and then it went into um, Andre Nepola, and then John Curry won, who was one of my favorite skaters because he was absolutely opposite of me, um, and then Robin Cousins, and then I won. So I was the next American champion after uh, David Jenkins, and then Boitano won after me, and then we've had a couple, a lot of Russians in there, and then uh, Evan Lysacek won. So the men's figure skating thing is only a bit, da, 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 da. and you know, I, if if history holds true, um, and Nathan Chen wins next year's world championships, he'll go into the Olympics as the a U.S. man world champion. And every single time in history, a U.S. men's world champion went to the Olympics, they won the gold medal every single time. Better knock on every some wood. Right. Well, I mean, it's a, like, it's just every single time. It's like, you know, they had the curse, right? Because the Canadians, every time they go in as a world champion, they always take silver, right? So they always called it the Olympic, the world championship curse. And so they, they, at what time it was uh, Phil Hirsch from the Chicago Tribune. He was like, uh, you know, he goes, Evan, you're the world champion. You're coming in as, you know, this, he goes, he, he goes what do you think of the, the Olympic curse? And he goes, I don't know anything about it. And he goes, well, every world champion that's come in for a blah, 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 blah has um, ended up taking silver instead of gold. And I pulled Evan over. I go, 
not every American has done it, so don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> and he won the Olympics. So, you know, it's, it's really cool to see the, the men's figure skating and how from Dick Button's athleticism, it's come up, it's come up, it's come up, it's come up. And uh, it's been really exciting uh, to see that. And now it's culminating in Han Yu winning two back-to-back -back Olympic um, gold medals and that excitement. And now he's young enough to win a third. And we'll see whether he's able to do something that's never been done or whether Nathan's able to come up and uh, do, you know, just take the sport. It, 40 point wins are kind of hard to figure out how to beat those guys. But men's figure skating has had a rich history. It's really fun. So I want to talk now a little bit about ice dancing. It was introduced to the Olympics in 1976. And uh, the US won a bronze medal in that very first Olympic uh, dance competition with Jim Milnes and Colleen O'Connor. I actually um, was in a dorm with Jim Milnes when I went to the wagon wheel when I was 13 years old. And great guy. He was Gordy McKellen's roommate. So we got to know each other pretty well. And uh, they were bronze medalists too. Packham Ober and Gorshkov. Alexander Gorshkov now is, I, he was president of, U, of uh, Russian figure skating for a while. And he's very involved in the political aspects of all that stuff. But in 1980, it's a funny story, uh, Linichuk and Karpanazov won the Olympics. And so we went to the world's in Dortmund after that. And I was at that, we were we would practice after the dance and um, they had these this outdoor rink and um, and they uh, it was really weird that Karpanazov, like most people wore spandex with the shiny side or the, the dull side out, or, you, know, you know, shiny or dull. So he wore the shiny side out on the spandex and he was using the restroom one time and it splashed all up against his costume and he came out and he was complaining about everything. So I affectionately called him from that day forward P.P. Karpanazov. <laughs> and he hated me for it. But anyway, well, um, that was just a really kind of gross, funny story. Um, so then it went on and on and on. And, um, and uh, you know, of all the, the 12 Olympic contests in ice dancing, uh, seven have been won by Russia. But you look at the last three, North America, uh, two Canadian, one America. It, the sport has changed through the IJS, and now it's become more of a uh, – like a judge athletic competition than it was back then, which was purely artistic. It was all done by uh, taste. Um, but I want to go back to the third uh, couple to win the Olympic gold medal was Torval and Dean in 1984. Uh, Chris, uh, and it was funny, I call him my brother from another mother because we came up identically. Our very first international competition was in Oberstdorf. We both came in second. Our very first uh, Worlds, uh, we both came in 11th, uh, and then Olympics, fifth, and then four years of undefeated. And, then, and so to this day, you know, it's like we joke that um, we ended up buying identical cars without knowing it. Um, I've had two sons. He had two sons. Um, and so I, I really want to get him in one of these webinars before we're all done doing this because he is such a wealth of information. I can never talk about ice dancing as well as he does. Um, he's unbelievable. And uh, um, yeah, I'm going to definitely reach out to him and get him on one of these webinars. So pair skating, um, that's something that's um, pretty amazing. It's been dominated by Rush over the years. It's been part of the Olympics since 1908. The very first uh, figure skating competitions were in the summer games. A lot of people don't know that. Um, but in 1908 um, was the first uh, Olympic figure skating competition held with the Summer Games. And um, it's really interesting. The fourth pair to win, they won in 1928 and 1932. Their names were Andre Jolet and Pierre Brunet. They eventually married and moved to the United States in 1940. Now, if you know anything about world history, you know that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis started their occupation of France in the 19, in 1940s. So it was obvious that the Brunets, um, they, they fled France when um, Hitler uh, invaded and took over France. And um, the funny thing was, was Pierre Brunet was my coach from 1972 until 1975. He retired in 1975. And he was an expert in compulsory figures. He knew more about, he invented blades. He invented um, like the gold seal blade is a Pierre Bourdain invention. The gold test blade is a 
figure blade that was a Pierre Brunet invention. He designed both the blades. He won seven French singles titles and um, along with 11 French pairs titles. He was an amazing champion. And he was one of those guys, this is like old school stuff. He would never give up on a lesson, no matter how bad I was, no matter like how clueless I was. Here's how clueless I was when it came to figures. He made me put a white lace on my left skate because I couldn't figure out which was my left and which was my right when I was taking a figure lesson from him. I would get so nervous, but he, he taught me how to do a double axle, clean edge takeoff. He taught me um, how to sort of develop a, a, a real good discipline in figures and, and start to understand where, and I still use like his French accent when he does loops, like an outside, like a forward outside loop. It was like, okay, now rock, little toe, little toe, little toe, little toe, little I'd uh, <laughs> rock, come out. And so it was always like, and, and inside loop was like, uh, big toe, big toe, big toe, big toe, and out. <laughs> you know, so it was always rocking up to the big toe and the inside loop, and rocking up to the out, uh, little toe on the outside loop. And he would, he would. My, some of my lessons would last two hours because he wouldn't give up until he one hundred percent knew that I understood every single word that he was saying in that lesson. And it was just amazing um, what he accomplished and um, what an incredible gentleman he was. But if you go back to the 1936 Olympics, this one's really fun to think about. They were held in Germany and a German team of Maxi Erber and Ernst Bayer won the gold under the Nazi flag. Like if you go back and you look, it wasn't a German flag, it was a Nazi flag back then. And it's truly amazing how the world um, history reveals itself through Olympic moments. Um, it's funny how that Olympics was held in Germany in Garmisch Partenkirchen. And then you go to the summer games were held in Berlin and that's where Jesse Owens won his gold medal against a dominant German athlete. And during the medal ceremony, Hitler left. He would not shake the hand of an African American man. He was an, it was, uh, Hitler was the worst guy um, ever born to this planet um, easily. Uh, the Americans have medaled only six times. This is a really funny story three silver and three bronze. But the interesting story was in 1964, um, the, um, it's a story about the American team, Vivian and Ronald Joseph. In 64, the, the German team of Kilius and Balmer were expected to win and, and they were like the heavy favorites, but they were beaten by the first Russian team to win it, uh, Belusa, Belusova and Protopopov. And, and so the, 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 the Germans ended up with the silver but here's where it gets really funny. The, uh, oh, sorry. And then the Canadian team of Wilkes and Ravel took the bronze with the USA team of Vivian and Ronald Joseph coming in a surprising fourth place. They were the second place American team, but they came in fourth and they were thrilled. Ah, but now the plot thickens. Um, later, it would be determined that Kilius and Balmer had signed a professional contract to be in an ice show before the games took place. And so they were stripped of their silver medal. Okay, so with the embarrassment of the ISU and all this, this, this crazy thing. So it, it wasn't until 1967, three years later, in a very subdued medal presentation in Chicago that the Josephs were presented with their bronze medals. And then at the 67 Canadian Championships, uh, Wilkes and Ravel were pre presented their silver medals. Um, but the, it was in 1987 that the IOC, prodded by two German members, quietly, quietly reawarded Kilius and Balmer their silver medals, stating that the couple seemed rehabilitated. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what in the world? What, what, what was happening? It's like absolutely insane. And no real mention of this was made by any of the governing bodies. And to this day, it remains a mystery of um, to, to many of how and why this, this all took place. So there, if you look on that year in 1964, there's two silver medalists listed and then the Josephs are medaled. And, and, and I, I had the pleasure of having lunch with, um, with uh, Ronald Joseph and, uh, and he, he was just, he, he just he, like the, just the whole politics of all this and then the whole professional amateurism thing of all of this. 
Um, it was really um, amazing that when you see the history of this sport come alive in such crazy and goofy ways um, that, you know, it's just, it just, it's people, actual people do that. Then you think of 2002 in the pair event. Uh, if you ever watch that competition, you should watch it. I mean, if, if it ever exists like in real time, it was, it was amazing that the, the dominant team of, um, of, um, uh, oh, it's just, it just jumped out of my head. Um, oh, I got to look at that up because that's insane. Anyway, uh, the German team, um, Vespianova, Vespianova and um, uh, Sigurlice, they were the best team in the world by far. Everybody knew who they were. It was just awesome. Um, they were just amazing. Um, and they were totally expected to win. But the Canadian team of Selle and Peltier were, I mean, they were skating great all week. They looked confident. They actually, in the warm up of that competition, they collided. Anton Sigurlitze and uh, Jamie Selle collided at the very end of the warm up. And she was really shaken, had to be picked up by her partner, David Peltier, taken out the ice. So, um, you know, I thought they were going to be totally shaken up by that because Sigurlitze got right up and he helped her up and he was fine. But Jamie was like, you know, kind of woozy and kind of crazy. So, what ended up happening was, <laughs> Bespiava, I'm sorry. Um, I can never remember her name. Anyway, um, uh, they uh, the Russians went out and skated and skated kind of bumpy. They ran into each other on a on a twist, and then they were kind of shaky on landings, and it was really scratchy, and it, it just wasn't a great performance for them. And then the, the Canadians came out, and they skated lights out, clean, perfect. In fact, I was calling that event and I said, they are one throw triple loop away from an Olympic gold medal. And she, I mean, it was a huge throw triple loop. She stuck the landing and the marks came up and they lost the Olympic gold medal in a, in a broken tie, basically five judges to four. And it was a scandal. I mean, we were up there going, no way. That's like, that's no way in the world this could be happening. That was like, it was a by far a superior performance. There were some that still were so sold on, um, on you know, the Russian pair that they, uh, they, they, they said, no, 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 it, it was fine. It was good. It was like, really? Because <laughs> there are two totally different performances. And it created this gigantic scandal at the 2002 games. Like, even though the men's event was next and Yagudin was favorite, you know, it was Yagudin and Poshenko going head to head, nobody cared about the men's event coming up because they were all completely consumed with this. And then a French judge at the, at the judges meeting uh, raised her hand and she said, excuse me, but I was pressured to vote for the Russians. And then it was like Pandora's box opened. It was just like all these conspiracy theories over the years just sort of came alive and like, see, it's, you know, there are judges fixing. And it was like, it was awful. So um, what ended up happening was um, the IOC stepped in and said, um, we see, you know, we're looking at this, the um, uh, ISU president, Jean Quanta, didn't want to have anything to do with it. He kept distancing himself. He had relationships with France, and they helped him get elected president. He really didn't want to, you know, shake the, you know, uh, you know, rock the boat, as it were. And so the IOC came in and said, we're going to award gold medals to each of the athletes. And so, you know, he had two gold medals in the 2002 games, and it was just alarming. But that was kind of the slide financially of the sport. You can see from there, uh, you know, less people were coming out. Um, the ice shows were starting to really struggle and fail. And I think a lot of people just lost faith in, in that time. And, and it was right after that that the IJS uh, came into being. And um, it was uh, really cool the way that, um, uh, you know, they were able to kind of take that and say, no, 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 we need to kind of take the sport as much and put it in the skater's hands and less in the judge's hands. And, and we can come up with a result that way. So uh, the IJS has been, uh, uh, you know, tweaked and more tweaked and tweaked her and tweaked dust. And it's like, they're still kind of always kind of coming up with new ways of making it better for the athletes and for the, 
for the viewing public. And I think now the viewing public has started to really get into, you know, they forget the old 6.0 system. I bet none of you even knew it existed. You're all too young to remember any of that stuff. So, yes. And Scott, I was just gonna say, um, we we brought in Gail Tanger last night and yeah. she did about an hour and a half of um, breaking down components. So yeah. I think it'll be really interesting. What I would love to do is I would love to show the skaters sometime this week or early well, next week, I guess it's already Friday, um, Elena Berejnaya and um, Anton Secretly's performance and Jamie Sele and David Peltier's performance. And we'll look at how a scandal could have really been the, the pivotal moment and the turning point for our sport. So we will get back to you next week about what they learn and why it's so important that we're now using the IJS. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's taken some of that joy out of the audience because uh, really deconstructing the point system and how it works has been a struggle from the media perspective. So maybe that's something that you can talk about. I mean, they've gone so many different measures to try to get the audience to understand what they're seeing. And I think mm -hmm. it's fascinating because now it's not just, well, they fell or they stood up. There's just so many layers. So it'll be an interesting thing. We can, we can touch on that next week. If you like. Well, that's great. And that allows me to transition into the anchor sport of every Olympic games. It's the last sport of the last night. And that is the ladies ch competition. And I just saw that our very, 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 I can't say it enough, our bestest of the best um, guest, uh, Olympic gold medalist, Christy Yamaguchi has joined our little webinar here. And Christy, welcome. I think your mic is off. Is it? Oh, you're on your iPad. Hi, this is so honored to have you. Yay! Say hi, Christy. So, so uh, Christy, if, if for all of you that don't know, it is um, she's won an Olympic gold medal. She has a uh, two world championships and a junior worlds in singles and pairs. Hello, and is just uh, um, she holds um, the illustrious title as my absolute best friend in all my skating life and years and I adore her and um, you know when we were doing a book reading on uh, her uh, Facebook live the other day I go oh I'm doing a talk on <laughs> Friday <laughs> and you know it's like can you join us so welcome to our podcast and I know we've got a lot of skaters uh, a lot of girl skaters on there I know they're excited to have you on there but um, let's talk a little bit about your career and and uh you know tell me how you started skating i know it was not it was under odd circumstances because you really you, you, you the idea that you ever became an athlete was unique because of wh how you were um what a condition you were born with yeah so i was actually born with very turned in feet it was my mom explains it was kind of like when you cross your arms that's how my legs were when i was born and it took some correction to to get them straight and even and i had casts on uh, both legs from the time i was like two weeks old and until about 18 months old and then uh corrective braces on uh my feet uh beyond that uh, probably until i was about two and a half or three years old and but it you know i, I think i was really lucky they corrected it early on and um in some ways, I, I'm bow-legged, and I'm like I'm not sure if that's part of it, but in skating, it's probably a little good thing to be bow-legged. <laughs> it's a great thing, it really is. So uh, that worked out, but yeah, who would have guessed that I would have gone on and used those legs to kind of pursue my dreams and and go after an uh, Olympic uh, Olympic dream there? But it's I, yeah, my parents were just obviously very proactive and supportive to correct it early on and. Um, skating was something I, I saw after doing a scene and ice show. I just I wanted to try it, and they said, "Well, it's probably good for strengthening and coordination." Um, so it, uh, yeah, it didn't really start out as therapy, but I think it was just a good activity to, to give me some strength and confidence too. How old were you when you started? I was six years old. Okay, group lesson, oh. you know. <laughs> Scared to death, I clung to the rail because I just was so shy and I didn't want to, you know, I don't know, interact with 
the other kids and the the teacher i was just so terrified but eventually i i i took to it and it was i i, I wanted to go back every day after that isn't that funny i think that um, most of us are that way you know we find something and it just sort of like it it appeals to us in, in many 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 different ways and then we just feel like wow this is kind of who i am now and i i don't i don't want to do anything else this is all i really want to do so that's that's awesome so when you got into your were you a single skater only when, how did all of that go into like now doing two events like tell me about that yeah so skating um singles pretty much and you know back then we also did the uh the compulsory figures so the figure <laughs> yeah. which yeah i think it's, it's such a hard concept for people to <laughs> wrap their head around these days um but many hours spent on that so up until i was about from six to eleven was doing single skating and it was about the intermediate ladies uh level and then I was introduced to my eventual pair partner, Rudy Galindo. And he, <laughs> yes, yes, then the adventure began. Um, he had actually just won the Novice Men's National Championship. And um, amazing talent and artistic and, you know, everything you know of his skating today. Um, but it was funny because our coach just thought, oh my gosh, you two are so cute and little together because I, I probably weighed I think I weighed about 56 pounds when we started <laughs> skating together I could, I could lift you that's great <laughs> I was teeny tiny and he was little too you know I mean he was probably you know 85 pounds <laughs> so um you know they just put us together because they thought we were so tiny and cute and um you know before we knew it we were at nationals at the novice pair level um and it was i think just a unique pairing because we were both essentially single skaters and very strong single skaters but um you know we and we were opposite skaters too rudy jumps yeah, gonna opposite that, yeah. Jumps and spins uh, yes so we mirrored mirrored a lot on the ice uh so just brought i guess a different look to uh pair skating at the time so uh, so novice pair champions and then it was like really fast up to senior right yeah pretty fast i mean at, and at the same time both of us were doing singles kind of concurrently while we were skating pairs as well and um yeah and you know it's uh novice pairs and then we went on to junior um i think we only spent one year there and then uh you know our first senior event um I think we were like fourth or fifth, but then we went to Worlds, you know, the following year. And uh, so, yeah, it was a pretty quick rise. And I think due to the fact that our, you know, individual skating was so strong and, um, you know, we literally skated maybe one hour a day together, <laughs> wow. which was not a, you know, I mean, for a national senior level pair team, but we skated two to three hours of singles, you know, a day. So, you know, that time on the ice just, you know, made us strong and strong as we got together. But so we had, we had a lot of fun. It was um, 1989 and 1990 were the years that we won pair titles. And I actually have more national pair titles than I do singles titles. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was like, that was an extremely strong time in our nation's history of women's skating, too. I mean, you're up against Tanya, who was, you know, skating really well back then, and also Nancy Kerrigan, and, and there was a lot of, of really, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was, that was really, really strong. So, I, I remember um, I was commentating, and you were exhausted, because you were doing singles and pairs and all these competitions, and, and it became obvious that um, it, you could really take off as an individual skater, but it was really hard for you to be competitive in singles and the pair. It's just, it felt like you guys had really kind of hit your groove and, and kind of peaked out because of all the other countries that were so dominant in, in that sport. So that whole, I remember it was an exhibition and you were so exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and you were behind where we were doing commentary and you were just 
crying so hard. I just felt so bad for you. But <laughs> uh, I, yeah, that's one of my most vivid memories of competition. It was Halifax Worlds, and I had literally competed five days in a row. So we had like figures, then pair short program the next day, then like single short program, then pairs long program, and then single long program. And I skated very below average in all. because <laughs> I. Was <laughs> and I remember by the time the exhibition came around, I was just like, I don't even want to go out there again. <laughs> and I looked up at you in the booth and literally this was you. You had a box of tissues in your hand and you're like, yeah. <laughs> you okay? And I just oh. remember on your face and I was just like, oh my gosh, this guy is amazing and he gets it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it's funny because there's a lot of little, 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 littles out there. There's a couple older skaters, but a couple of little littles. Tell, tell everybody, and this is just, I'm sorry, we're going off the rails a little bit on this, but tell everybody about the first time we met. <laughs> okay, so the first time I met Scott, I was eight years old, and it was at the U.S. National Championships in uh, San Diego, California. So um, <clears throat> a group of us drove down, and it was just kind of a big, you know, few of us from our club, and attended all of the events, and it was just amazing to be up close and personal with so many of our skating idols. And um, you know, we watched the men's event and, you know, threw flowers onto the ice. And, you know, when Scott competed, it just, the, the ice was covered, right? So I was like, well, I'm not going to get, just throw my flower out there with everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> later on in the day, I saw him sitting mm -hmm. in the audience watching uh, another event. And um, I timidly went up to him and handed him a, a little rose and you know he was my favorite skater and I was just like oh my gosh I'm so shy but you know I want to give him this rose so I kind of just held it out to him and he's like <laughs> for me <laughs> he just made me feel like I was you know his only fan in the whole world and he was so <laughs> appreciative of getting that flower and uh you know I mean talk about inspiring a young little skater there and, and uh, making them feel special. But you reminded me of that story when we were in Alberville and you guys were doing a pre-Olympic competition and <clears throat> it was a uh, uh, Grand Prix of France or whatever it's called, La Ligue Trophy back then, oh. right? So you guys are doing your thing in one rink. I'm in the practice rink trying to get a little time in because I was on tour at that time. And you came in and you threw a rose on the ice and it was just like, oh, that's right. Oh my goodness, all these stories. So, you know, we, you know, we have a lot of um, young skaters on and, and it's just, your story is so remarkable because again, you know, being, you know, having that, you know, sort of those years in the cast and then in the, in the braces and, and, you know, the last thing anybody would ever think was that you'd be able to use your legs to, to do something extraordinary. You know, you share um, a, a couple things, I guess, is who were your role models? Um, who were the people that you really admired and how did you use those uh, examples to kind of uh, inspire you every day when you were on the ice? Uh, I mean, lots of different role models, I think, growing up and coming up. Um, you know, I mean, early on, Dorothy Hamill was a big idol of mine. Um, but, you know, later on, I mean, obviously, Scott, you were and you know, you brought so, uh, you know, you brought your own personality and your own style to the ice. And I think you weren't afraid to uh, blaze a trail for so many people. I mean, everything from, you know, saying, hey, I'm not going to wear, you know, fluffy, fancy sequin outfits. I'm going to be, you know, this is a, a, an athletic sport and I'm going to look you know, athletic, and you weren't afraid to, you know, try different things and go against the norm and, and really create your own style. So I love that and just being able to infuse so much personality in your skating. Um, you know, Brian Boitano was another uh, big mentor. He was a local skater in the Bay Area as well. So 
I got to observe, you know, I mean, there wasn't a ton of interaction between us, but I did get to observe and see how he trained and prepared for the Olympics. So yeah, that, that's, know, that's a great example because the way that guy trained was just insane. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he worked so hard. So I, you know, seeing that it was like, okay, that's what it takes. That's how you have to train and how focused you have to be and, you know, not wasting one minute on the ice. Um, yeah. I mean, he, he was, uh, you know, it was great to be able to see that, uh, not on a daily basis, but, <clears throat> you know, maybe once or twice a week, I would, uh, be able to share the ice with him. So, uh, that was so invaluable. Um, but, you know, I mean, other athletes too, like Michael Jordan, I mean, he just brought so much excellence to everything he did. And I think the fact that he was never satisfied with uh, what, you know, he was- To doing, this day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, always making himself better and, yeah. you know, never complained and just raised people's um, performances around him up too. You know, he was just- uh, an amazing guy and you just never heard anything negative or bad about him so it was uh you know amazing role model bonnie blair she's one of my idols oh, too. Bon oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well that's those are all i mean amazing role models but you know the one thing i i really loved is um when you won the olympics you know, the very first thing you did was come to Stars and Ice, which I thought was, well, it was the second thing you did. Before that even, you launched your foundation. Um, tell everybody about that, about what went into that and, and why that was so important for you to kind of step into that role, like day one of your professional career. Well, actually, I launched it after I joined Stars on Ice. Ah, okay, well, you need to yeah. really kicked off, so, right? yeah. But Stars on Ice did play a role in that because when I joined the tour, Make-A-Wish Foundation was the beneficiary of Stars on Ice. That's right. And yeah. Okay. Yep. Coming back. And that was um, kind of my first time being hands-on with a, an organization and the actual beneficiaries, the families of the foundation. So, um, I mean, as you know, Scott, I mean, when you uh, spend a day with the families and you make that connection with them and you you know, you see the hardships and the challenges that these children are facing and uh, just the, the, the power, uh, you know, feeling that and the reward of being able to, you know, just have a little bit of a positive sliver of, of you know, a, a day with them um, just hit home so much. So that really inspired me to do more and to establish my own foundation, uh, which is always dream. Yeah, Always Dream Foundation. And it's taken on many roles throughout the years, you know, for your, I know initially it was, you did a lot of work in cancer and you were getting involved in a lot of breast cancer awareness. And then we, we did that one Olympic camp for the um, handicapped children. We did that Olympics in Hawaii at that YMCA thing. That was like, that was so much fun. And, but now you've taken another turn and you've gotten more specific with the <laughs> role of Always Dream. Yes, I think, you know, when we were young and growing and learning our way still, we, yes, it was a broad range of uh, causes that we supported. But, um, you know, after getting off the tour and being a full-time mom and, and having time to really dedicate to the foundation, I said, okay, let's, let's really put some roots down and go narrow and deep in one area. And um, early childhood literacy, you know, I just, I knew that to have success in life, you had to have a good education. Well, how are you going to succeed in school? You have to have that foundation of reading. Um, and, you know, as a kid, being that shy, introverted kid, books were a huge outlet for me. And, you know, I think I found, I learned so much and I just uh, experienced so much through books that, um, you know, it, it was just a special thing for me. So, um, you know, I, I wrote a couple books for my own daughters, uh, children's picture books. And uh, so it just, it really made sense. So many arrows were pointing towards early literacy and, um, you know, developing a program that can target our youngest students which in kindergarten age kids and giving them access. Cause we know that, you know, I mean, we had bookshelves of, of books, right? And, and, you know, after the fifth book, I'd be like, okay, no more, you gotta go to bed now. <laughs> like no more books. <laughs> but, 
you know, 60% of low income families have zero books in the home. And I, I couldn't imagine that. I could not imagine uh, not having something to read to uh, our children. So, um, you know, just providing high quality uh, books for that are age appropriate for uh, these families uh, is what's going to hopefully be the, the critical resources to get them off on the right foot. Wow, and I I love that. I, I I really do. It's you know it's it's you know we always say you know if you can if you can uh, turn your podium into a platform, that's you've done your job well. And you know we we're all trying to do that. I know, you know, when I look around at the at the different champions, they you know they were all trying to get involved in their communities out of gratitude, and and it's it's really strong. I mean, it, it's 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 a great 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 thing so i know um we've got a you know oh, we got some time left but um i want I, <laughs> I want i want you to talk a little bit about because it was so much fun to watch um your time on dance with the stars and you know just what went into that decision and then just everything that um happened with that um yes and probably some of those kids out there are like what's dancing with the stars <laughs> so young <laughs> you were on it was like almost 11, like 11 years ago now. Yeah, uh, 12 years ago. So wow, it doesn't I seem know. That long ago. Yeah. And um, but yeah, it was scary to go on because at that time my daughters were about two and four at the time, and I hadn't yeah, skated. Yeah, I, I mean I'd been you know at home being mom for four years, so I couldn't imagine going on live TV and being judged again and <laughs> being critiqued. Um, and but so it was a scary thing but i thought hey let's this sounds like fun because i i was a fan of the show and i loved the dancing watching it not knowing you know how to do it but i had an amazing partner mark bellis and um he was really young at the time it was only his second season on the show and he was only 21 but yeah. um you know he was just he's so talented and has incredible vision and it was really easy for me to kind of fall back into that. Okay, I'm a student now. I'm learning from this professional, and just really try to be open to that uh, learning. Um, you know, every now and then, I, I kind of felt like his mom. Where I'm like, okay, focus here. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, we're not but doing then you that. have your all your pair skating. Was it able to do? You know, bring that into it, and then your understanding of choreography and how to do. I mean, it was just the perfect thing for you to do. Yeah, no, it was, it was fun. It was just like, you know, from the waist up, it was just, you know, you know, people like, oh, you're I'm like, believe me, waist down is so different. Like, you know, skating, you're gliding on the ice and, you know, your upper body's kind of expressing the music, but your feet are gliding or moving in a certain way. And in dance, it's like every beat, you have to be right on beat and you know, your foot has to touch the floor a certain way every time you step. So, um, yeah, that, that was a tough one because, you know, he was, he was really hard on me. It's like, no, no, your heel touched first. <laughs> and I'm like, so? no, you have to step with your ball of your foot first or something, whatever it was. I don't know. It was yeah. just, it was way more technical than I ever thought, but it was, it was a fun experience. Exhausting too. I mean, that was, um, I cannot wait for a day off. Uh, on that show. <laughs> you don't get one. <laughs> so then you you won. You, you set every record. I think scoring record they ever had. You you did all that, and so then they get this big trophy, right? So where is the trophy? Where is that? So the trophy's here at our house, and it's mm -hmm. um, we have like this little uh, display area, and my husband's like, oh, there's there's where the mirror ball trophy can go underneath the stanley cup trophy <laughs> <laughs> I was like, does he get a replica of the stanley cup? i mean what what do they get yeah, when so they, they have this? like little replica i mean it's actually yeah. pretty good it's probably like a foot and a half big and you know all their great names are engraved on it so it is, it's literally a little mini stanley cup which is really okay. cool. so for, for those of you that don't know christy mary brett hedekin who won a stanley cup championship with the nhl Carolina Hurricanes and uh, you know he'd been in game sevens you know a few times before that in the final and they finally broke through and they won and 
Um, so you've got an Olympic gold medal and a Stanley Cup and a Mirabal trophy all in the same house. You know, I hope you had, you know, a lot of room for all that stuff. And then your daughter's winning hula competitions now and doing all that, which is insane. So, um, you know, a wonderful legacy, a wonderful history in your family of just success, which I really oh. love. That's oh. awesome. So, so we've got a lot of young skaters on, on this uh, webinar and a lot of, um, you know, these are all our, our kids, our skaters and they a lot of them you know took their very first steps with us others are coming in from other places but we're locked out we're, we're mm -hmm. locked out but um first thing i want to ask because we've got enough time for this and um is is <clears throat> you know tell uh, you know as, as far as your best advice to kids when they're when they're just getting into competing and when they're just sort of forming their training habits what advice would you give our young skaters um best advice um you know set goals for yourself i think that was one of the most valuable things i learned early on is like you know you can have so many things directing you in so many different directions but if you really focus on you know maybe one big one for the year and then setting smaller goals for yourself um, every week you know every month and then like even every practice session you know i mean my coach christy ness was um very tough, tough <laughs> very uh task oriented he's, he's like okay now this session is your short program session and you work on your combination and get it more clean or whatever it was you know work on that combination spin and getting the position sharper whatever it was like every session i went out with um something i knew i wanted to do whether it was like okay you know yesterday i missed you know the triple sow which was typical in my <laughs> run through today i got <laughs> run through <laughs> Subcat was not my favorite jump. So, uh, so yeah, so, you know, every, you know, setting those small goals for yourself um, and, and that keeps you motivated to eventually, you know, get you closer to that big goal at the end of the year. Yeah. And uh, last thing, favorite, like when you look back on your entire professional and amateur competitive career, when you look back at it all, was there a moment, one moment that stands out above all others? Oh, Wow, that is a tough one. Um, I'm here to be tough. I'm here to be tough. I know. Like Christina, it's tough. It's a tough one. Um, I mean, so many great moments. I mean, obviously that moment. Um, uh, well, okay, I, I, I'll have one. Winning my first world title. It, it oh, was, wow. I mean, obviously the Olympics is the obvious one, but winning with the first world title, it was a rough year and actually, there were doubts that I would even continue on and keep skating at that point. But, um, you know, I, I hit the, the, the pivot turn where it was just like, okay, no, I'm turning this around. I'm going to enjoy the skating. And I went to the world championships in 1991 and had fun at every single practice session. I, uh. enjoyed, um, you know, I, I went out and I actually, it was the first time I ever looked a judge in the eye during my the footwork in my long program it is the italian judge and he gave me my very first 6-0 <laughs> that's it so, see eye contact is extremely important with the judges it really oh, I is know. Well, and believe me never in my life even if i saw a judge walking down the hallway i would look the other way and i would just be like oh my gosh oh my gosh like there's a judge and this was literally the first time like i remember the move it was like this move and i looked right at him and <laughs> Uh, I got, you know, my first 6-0 in, in artistic impression. So, uh, which we, we can't, we don't have time to explain what that mark is <laughs> compared to these more days. More homework, more homework. Yeah, but um, uh, so that, I guess, performance and competition stood out. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I'm, I, I owe you, still owe no, you. Yeah, um, are you kidding? You no, this are. is great, but we, um, we, I, owe uh, you know, I so admire you. So and for being here with our skaters. Thank you, thank Yay. you. Oh, thanks, Yay. yeah. No, it was fun, and, you know, it would be, it, you know, I, this is so valuable. I mean, congratulations on both of you for doing something, uh, wow. you know, that kids are probably, hopefully, getting a lot out of every week, you know, hearing from you guys. 
Well, it's, it's been, you know, this is, you know, the one thing we can do to, to keep everybody really motivated and keep them interested and to, and to learn what, you know, if they can't be on the ice with their feet, they can be, they could be keeping their minds and their hearts and their, you know, desires very engaged and, you know, meeting people like you and, and talking different aspects of skating and, and really learning more about what this is all about. So I so appreciate you doing this today. And I, I really appreciate Corey and um, putting these on and um, thank you, Yam. Thanks. Absolutely. No, thank you. And good luck everyone out there, you know, keep your focus and have fun. I mean, that is the most important that thing. That is the most, most important yeah. thing. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, you got to figure a way out a way to get that done. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Give my love to everybody. Love I you. Will. Love you. Love and, you too. Uh, all right.